As you may be able to tell from my background, I'm a professor at Kansas State University. My name is Tom Tinder, and I'm an attorney from Charleston, West Virginia. And we're here obviously for unit six, question number one, which I will read. In 1963, Darden- oh, Wait a minute, Steve. Let's have the kids introduce themselves. Okay. I'm Bruno Da Costa, junior at Grange High School. I'm Valentin Santos, a junior at Greenwich High School. I'm Wyatt Radson, a junior at Greenwich High School. And I'm Tristan Pavlou, also a junior at Greenwich High School. Okay, now we can go with the que question. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King said, quote, never in the history of this nation have so many people been arrested for cause, the cause of freedom and human dignity, unquote. What lessons can be learned from the Children's March in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama? What is civic engagement? And what is its significance in American history? What responsibility, if any, do schools have to promote civic engagement? You may begin. Civic engagement can be defined as an action or involvement within one's community, and most notably one's involvement with, with their own government. <coughs> it can take many forms with participation in charities, religious institutions, protests, and voting, voting all serving as ways to get involved. Civic engagement has been a crucial force in U.S. history, beginning with our nation's founding. Thomas Paine's wildly popular pamphlet, Common Sense, serves as an example. Paine's pamphlet focused on persuading not loyalists, but common people unsure of their stance to pursue revolution, in effect promoting greater political engagement among a group that was initially apathetic towards independence. The spread of these revolutionary ideals ultimately spurred the Revolutionary War, which was essentially the product of mass civic engagement. In a way, therefore, the U.S.'s very existence is the result of civic engagement, an idea that continues to impact both our society and democracy. In 1849, for instance, Henry David Thoreau's ever-prominent essay on the duty of civil disobedience was published, detailing the practice of one particular type of civic engagement civil disobedience, or peaceful defiance of particular laws is a form of protest. In his discussion of the inaction of many against slavery, he states that, at most, they give only a cheap vote and a feeble countenance and Godspeed. In Thoreau's eyes, even voting isn't enough. To create substantial change, he believes that individuals must take strong and decisive action. It's important to note that while Thoreau's civil disobedience does involve law-breaking, civic engagement-related rights are enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. The rights to assembly, speech, and petition, for instance, are crucial parts of the First Amendment. Thoreau's ideas were practiced throughout the civil, the civil rights movement as well. In particular, the Children's March in Birmingham, Alabama, served as a tragic but inspiring event. Children protested and were met with brutal police violence and arrest. This lies at the heart of the controversy surrounding this march. Many prominent individuals from Robert F. Kennedy to Malcolm X criticized the decision to include children in civil rights protests for safety reasons. This brings to light an important aspect of civic engagement that applies to all age groups. Simply being passive is not enough to create substantial change. While facing violence is not absolutely necessary by any means, doing so can be as, as effective as it is tragic. The suffering endured by the Children's March participants, for instance, grabbed headlines and fueled the civil rights movement. As such, active civic engagement is the catalyst for real change in America. As the institutions that educate America's future generations, schools have a fundamental responsibility to promote civic engagement. This idea was heavily discussed by classical philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes. In The Leviathan, he discusses the importance of education, noting that, quote, universities are the fountains of civil and moral doctrine, end quote. Hobbes asserts that to maintain a civil and moral society, schools must teach younger generations properly and in a manner that fosters civic engagement. Similar ideas are explored by Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America, with Tocqueville warning that, quote, the time is fast approaching when social order itself will not be able to exist without education, end quote. As both Hobbes and Tocqueville explain, schools are not only centers for education, but the gateway for students to enter into a civic life within their local communities, including and beyond critical constitutional structures, such as voting. Mandatory community service is a policy already enacted in a multitude of states, and as expressed by a study from the University of Arizona, it increases community service engagement in high school and beyond. Other community institutions, such as churches and local organizations, can also fuel civic engagement. Regardless of the position of schools have on civic engagement, the question is of how they should respond to acts of civil disobedience that inherently break some rules to stands. The Supreme Court has in the past affirmed the right of non-disruptive expression, expression in schools in Tinker v. Demois. However, in recent years, a new challenge has emerged. In response to gun violence, walkouts sweeping the nation, schools have the choice to either allow students to march with little to no consequence or punish them. Which approach is better? If Thoreau were asked 
he would almost certainly choose the latter. Tutoro facing punishment for one's civil disobedience is part of the process. As he claimed, open quote, under a government that imprisons unjustly, the true place for a just man is also in prison. End quote, we're now open for questions. Thank you very much. In what ways does the Constitution support and limit civic engagement? Well, one important way in which the Constitution supports civic engagement is through the First Amendment, which offers um, the rights to speech, petition, assembly, and many other expression-related rights. Um, and one uh, interesting dynamic in terms of limiting civic civil disobedience is state versus federal rights as expressed in the 10th amendment different um uh, you know as evidenced in recent protests there can be a lot of tension between state and federal governments in terms of how to respond to protests um and whose hands it's in ends up becoming a crucial part of the issue um in debates over whether a certain action is just or not Any limits in the Constitution on civic engagement? Well, I mean, it's been affir it's been affirmed in the past that the right to speech, um, you know, while an individual can is, expre is expressed um, in certain instances, individuals do not necessarily have to. Um, uh, individuals can be offensive and speak offensively, um, but an individual's right to speech is subject to um, certain restrictions, depending on the situation. Excellent. Excellent. Let's uh, turn our attention to civil disobedience. In your, uh, <clears throat> in your prepared statement, um, you seem to be pro-civil uh, disobedience. Um, is civil disobedience an appropriate form of civic engagement under any conditions? We view civil disobedience as a not an absolute necessary, but as a very effective form of civic, civic engagement. Although, like I said, it's absolutely not necessary. Facing punishment for one's action, as Thoreau expresses, is a good form to show how unjust the actions are in, in your views. Uh, uh, so, yeah, to expand on what my colleague was getting to, um, it's really circumstantial when it comes to what would be a case in which civil disobedience is acceptable. Um, and it, it's more up to the, up to the people who are uh, engaging in a form of civil dis disobedience to determine what they're willing to risk and what is the reward they're willing to get for that risk. And um, and it's for the populace as a whole that views this civil disobedience to come up with their own moral interpretation of, is this allowed, is this what we want our country to be like? Is this the direction we want to head? Fantastic. Now let's, let's focus it specifically on this, uh, on this instance. What did Dr. King have to say about when civil disobedience is justified? Although he didn't want, at first he didn't want to use the children's in the march, he also understood that the problems that they suffered during the march were very uh, meaningful for the progression of the civil rights movement. And they were definitely one of the key aspects that ensured that the civil rights movement would achieve its goals in the future. And certainly while he was a bit more hesitant to the Children's March, he used civil disobedience throughout his uh, activism in the civil rights movement in many different ways. Thank you. You talked about mandatory um, civic engagement in uh, schools, and you also talked about voting. And in Australia, there is um, mandatory voting. Uh, are you in favor or opposed to uh, mandatory voting? Why? Well, in the case of Australia, you have to look at that their population is much smaller than other countries like the U.S. So if so, in their case, having mandatory, mandatory voting, it allows them to have for a minority not to overpower the majority. Because if you have a very small number of people voting, maybe some maybe the majority doesn't agree with their views. So in that case, I think it's more justified. But if you look at the U.S., the, the population is huge compared to other countries. 
So if you if some people don't want to vote, it, <coughs> change, it will not completely define an election or a government for that period of time. I also, also, oh. I also would like to build on it. Uh, if you take countries that have even more population and mandatory voting, like Brazil, uh, the population it doesn't mean exactly that the population will vote more. They can still vote blank, and that vote would be basically that it wouldn't mean anything. So just because the population has a has to vote doesn't mean they are expressing their views. Yeah, and building upon that, I think it's more important that we make voting easier than making it mandatory um, throughout our constitutional history, whether it was the 15th, the 19th, uh, et cetera, amendments. Um, we've, over the process of our nation's history, done more and more to allow our people to vote. Um, and there are certain proposals from, um, you know, uh, voting election day being a national holiday to even uh, doing things like completely abolishing the electoral college that are meant to uh, support voter engagement. And to put one final touch on that, it's how our country was designed. Our country was not necessarily designed with the intention that every single citizen is going to know everything. And that is why we have uh, power separated into federal and state governments. Thank you. Are we done? Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. The judges will provide their feedback uh, now, students. Thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. You, you had a lot of good substantive information you thought through. You had some good historical kind of, uh, kind of back, background. There was a good give and take that we, uh, we had. I thought you did an especially good job in terms of the follow-up uh, questions, but congratulations.